Greetings, Mr. Ahmed bin Sulaim. Very good to see you again. I know you are a busy man. Thank you very much for, for your time. Never, never too busy for you, my friend. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much, my brother. I think uh, before anything, I'd just like to start off by saying the first time I heard you speak was actually on an interview on Emirates Airlines, Emirates Radio. Uh, yeah, you're speaking about DMCC and the, 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 the different companies you, you're onboarding mm -hmm. and the milestones that you that was a mm -hmm. few years ago. Um, so I am privileged to be having this conversation with you and I thank you for, for taking this time out. The privilege is mine and uh, thank you very much. Uh, South Africa to me is, is one, of, one of the first steps to, to accessing Africa, African market. I mean, it was just to know where to start and uh, the, it was more or less kind of the benchmark and part of our business plan. We realized uh, Dubai can play a good role to bring uh, the Indian community and the African community in one area um, and it was conveni convenient for both traders. Um, I think where I'd like to start off is um, just for um, viewers that may not uh, know who you are, um, for the ones that do, excuse me for, for being repetitive. Mm -hmm. um, you are currently the executive chairman and CEO of DMCC, which stands for the Dubai Multi Commodities Center. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not going to take a shine away from you. I'll just ask you to unpack it. Um, but as I as I speak on, um, there's something that you mentioned: timing and time, which are very yes. key factors um, in getting things done. Uh, and I believe that's something that we can learn from, especially from from the UAE and, and more specifically from the way Dubai has done things. You know, us as Africans, um, South Africans, we look to to the Middle East, um, we look to the West, we look to the Far East for inspiration. Um, and, and assistance in, 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 in our journey of, of development, whether it be infrastructure, healthcare, education, whatever, whatever it is. And the one obvious um, bit of information that I'd like to, 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 to put forward, and that's from having seen this, this, this country grow over a very short period of time, is the time from concept to the time um, that the final product is, is put out. I think you are the, the, the UAE is second to none in the world in my view, on, mm -hmm. on, on, on the product that I put out at a very, very quick pace. So when we look at a, an African perspective versus um, Middle Eastern and more specifically um, the United Arab Emirates, um, we all know that you know, a lot of these countries in the Middle East are oil rich companies, uh, sorry, countries. And they have been able to develop their country for their people um, in terms of using whatever resource they had available naturally mm -hmm. to the oil in this case. In Africa, you've been to a lot of these countries and I have to appreciate you because you are a leader that leads from the front. You don't send out emissaries, um, you, you don't send out dignitaries, you, you are a front line leader. You travel to these countries, you meet these mm -hmm. people. There's, there's, there's times where I've seen you, um, you know, I hope I'm not stepping out of line, but I've seen you cold calling people. I mean, you are quite a big deal in this in this this part of the world, but you know that's who you are. This you know you want to get something done. Why wait for someone else? Why delegate time over the phone? Let me call this person and find out. And you actually did that yes. with the gold coin uh, yeah. uh, um, exercise that you did a few weeks ago. And congratulations! Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, a week and a half ago. Congratulations for that. We uh, since two thousand two till today. So a lot has changed, I believe, around the world and in South Africa. And this brings me back to an old story where I was, I was in South Africa looking to visit the government entities, talk to them about gold, diamond trade, but mostly introducing DMCC as a concept and seeing how we can co collaborate and work together. I have yet to meet uh, Minister Shibango, and I recall I had to go to Cape Town for some reason to see her there. I don't know how things work. I don't I remember exactly how things work, but... She was in Cape Town at that time, and I was in Joburg um, a day before or so, and we were sitting in, a, in the lobby of a hotel, and I saw this uh, elderly man. Um, he must have been in his 70s or something. And he noticed that I am from the Gulf. So he, uh, he asked me, you guys are Arabs? I'm like, yeah. What are you doing here? Because he knows, I think the, the Gulf people mostly at that time just go to France and London for, for vacation and stuff. 
We said we're here uh, for work. What kind of work? Well, we're creating a free zone. We're gonna wanna, we want to talk uh, to the government to see how we can um, grow our gold and diamond trade and connect with the industry in South Africa. He says, you're going to talk to the government? I said, yes. And he goes, no, that does not work. If you want to slow your process, he said, you talk only to the government. You, if you want real business, you have to talk to the traders. And I said, how about this? We'll talk to both and we'll work it out with both at that time. But I was only about 22, 23 years old at the time. Um, the, the feeling around African countries, uh, the concept of Al Mas Tower to be a reality and, it, and Dubai being a commodity trading center um, is seen by a lot of African countries, whether it's Egypt, uh, whether it's uh, Rwanda um, and, and Angola and Botswana and Namibia, they all feel like a big part of that should have been in their area because they're closer and all this. But funnily, the, the fact that Dubai is not a big consumer and it's not a big uh, producer of these commodities is actually an advantage because we're not com we don't play a conflicted role. You know, we work well with producing countries and consuming countries. And uh, that's no different from the likes of Singapore, Hong Kong. Um, we Personally, I'd be lying to you if I told you I envisioned DMCC to represent over 10,000 companies, let alone over 17,000 companies. But it's a middle blessing and you know, if, if there's two commodities that I would advise any anyone listening to our interview to focus on, and I believe even though our government doesn't mention these two commodities, but I believe these two commodities are very important to His Highness Sheikh Mohammed Rashid Maktoum and our leadership, it's time and timing. You know, you have to move. You cannot miss out on opportunity. You need to you need to know when to when to slow down and 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 be cautious. And you need to and, and you need to know when to hit the market. Uh, uh, and, and capture opportunities. So one example, I can give you a recent one. Yeah. Midway in, in Ramadan, it wasn't popular to, for my management to hear me talk about displaying the UAE gold bullion coins on Burj Khalifa while everyone was cutting costs. And I said, look, by the time the first day Eid kicks in, uh, people are going to be gearing up for business. And if there was any time to promote gold, this was it with this pandemic, with the crisis, with businesses failing, etc., cetera. Um, you have the likes of Warren Buffett apologizing, saying he's made a mistake for putting his investment into the aviation industry. There's so much uh, uncertainty. When there's this much uncertainty, gold is the safe haven. But more than just gold bars, um, I found a bigger opportunity to promote the UAE gold bullion coins that have the, 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 the image of his, the president of the UAE, Sheikh Khalifa bin Zayed, Al Nahyan and the Vice President, Prime Minister of the UAE, Sheikh Mohammed Rashid Maktoum, on both coins. We promoted those, and what I was looking for, aside from promoting the national product of the UAE, the UAE Gold Bullion Coins, was, was, was to have to get exception on a federal level, on a regional level, and on an international level. That's not the first and last step we're taking. There are other steps that we're looking at. We're, we're, we're looking at uh, ways of, of getting these coins to all the banks and traders and to this to uh, to uh, to uh, gold coins is, is easier to disperse than big gold bars. A lot more people can afford them. It can be moved. It's more flexible. So it was a great opportunity for us uh, to look at. That's just one example. How did the UAE, for example, get it right? Where you, you've heard of the term the, the the resource curse, where a country has a certain resource, but the curse is. They have this wealth, but they're not able to translate that wealth into development. And you've been to, to a lot of African countries, Central, Western, Southern, Eastern, um, and you've seen the rate of development in relation to the wealth that these countries have. Not time. How did the UAE, for example, get it right? How did you get it right as, as Mr. Ben Suleim? You know, you've developed the DMCC into uh, a trade zone second to none. How, how, how well, are you able to do that? Well, if you, if you follow His Highness' uh, Instagram and, uh, and his uh, social media, you'll notice he sends messages of experience, wisdom, etc. Um, I've been blessed to have grown up uh, around my father and, and hear stories about initiatives His Highness has done, um, the way he's dealt with the market. So um, with the gold coin, for example, I refused to have any retailer or uh, 
or distributor buy the cold coins and and try to 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 uh, to hold it from the end user so right now the buyers can come through DMCC and the refinery would produce it you'd pay the cost of refining the coin and the cost of gold so that's all you're going to pay for for the moment um, and I learned that really, I mean, I tried to allow the market to set it and all this, but there's a lot of greed. You can't control the greed. I mean, and, uh, and in history, we've learned from our, uh, our mistakes. So if you look at his highness book, My Vision, he talks about the uh, Pearl uh, crash. Um, one of the issues with, the, with that was that the, the main uh, revenue source was the pearls. But the mistake uh, that the, the trade and the market did at the time, they did not diversify. They put too much in one basket. So when, when the wars happened and the rise of the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the farm pearls came up from Japan, it killed it. But more than that, they overfished for those pearls. Um, when the Iran Iraq war happened, it affected Dubai because about 70% of the UAE's trade was, or Dubai's trade as well, was with with Iran. So from that experience, they 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 uh, they connected the airlines with multiple regions, made sure there are multiple trade routes, not just Iran. You know, with, in Africa and uh, Korea, Japan, China, India, uh, Europe, other places as well, and uh, Dubai will continue on that route. I did learn also the way they sold the Palm Jumeirah. There's been a lot of takers to buy the Palm Jumeirah, multi-billionaires. His Highness could have sold it with the value that, he, uh, that the company would have wanted to two, three uh, multi-millionaires or billionaires. But he didn't do that because he wanted the community to benefit. So he, so he puts a limit of three to four villas. Um, a bit of that affected me on the coin as well. I did not want uh, I did not want the price of the UAE gold bullion coin to be much more expensive than the Krugeran or the Double Eagle. I wanted them to be available in the same way. I'm not opposed to an idea of having a refinery somewhere in South America producing, minting UAE gold bullion coin and saving the logistic cost of shipping the cold coins from UAE all the way there. It, 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 it's not what I'm looking for at this stage. I'm looking to, to promote that to the max. So, so we learned a little bit of that. Also, you've got billionaires at that time, Walid bin Talal, who was a different person in the mid or late 90s than he is today. Walid bin Talal said, I'll buy the whole island. You, would, you don't need to bother about uh, building the rest of it. I just want one thing, uh, I just want condition. And the condition was he wanted to put, I think, two swords on the palm and that would be the logo of the Saudi channel I guess or something and the, that 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 did not uh, get, go through I mean that's something the UAE wasn't going to do at that time um, it's an interesting experience but uh, I I joined DMCC to gain experience and I think I think the uh, the attitude of learning and listening to our members regardless of uh, how old young or where they're from uh, fit uh, pay dividends for DMCC. Uh, we do work with consultants, but the expertise, the know-how, we deal with them. What what kept DMCC going through the uh, pandemic uh, crisis uh, is the fact that we have invested a lot on the digital side of marketing. A lot of our businesses can set up online, pretty much almost a hundred percent. We just need to have the individual who sets up the company. We need to see the person, or needs to go to a law firm or a service company that that can attest that they have come individually because, you know, with, 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 with hackers around the world, you never know. You need to see, you need to, you need to have that proof at least. But pretty much everything can be done online. Um, I'm happy to say that yesterday I went as an undercover CEO wearing my mask, sitting behind clients, seeing them come and go. And, and you know, I asked one of them who was handled by one of our employees called Jim after he was done. I said, are you happy with the, with the service? He said, I'm very much. And I said, did he answer every question you had? You had? He's like, yes. And you know, part of the question was he, was he was talking about in the case if he wants to close his restaurant down, what are the steps? And he would explain, you go through the liquidation process, this and that. He said, what if I have someone that's gonna purchase my shares? And that's a different process. So I asked him, would it be helpful if we already had a video explaining these steps so you'd see them on the website and save you time? Uh, why, when you sit here, you just know exactly what, he said, very much. And guess what? We're doing that right now. Even though DMCC is the number one free zone globally, does not mean we sit back and say, you know what? 
people should learn from us. No, we need to find ways of doing a better business. There's a reason why Apple used to uh, continue to provide new products. You know, they, they have a quote saying, we provide you services that you may not know you need. Uh, that's a bit arrogant in my opinion. I'd, I'd rather hear it from the clients. I'd rather test it, but still, it's, it's a good example in my opinion. And, um, and it doesn't stop there, you know, we could, we, we, for the tea industry, for example, we have the tea center, which blends, packages, serves, uh, uh, stores tea. Uh, we do the tea tag printing, a partnership with Gundlach to provide that service. We did not focus on the unilevers of the tea industry. The focus is also for the startups, the, the small players. Even Kenya, that used to see us as a competition to Mombasa, we met with them over 10 years ago or so. And after meeting with them, explaining what our services are, the Kenyan Tea Trading Authority set up in the tea center to redistribute their teas from Dubai. They saw the value addition and they put, they put uh, the, I guess, whatever rivalry people were assuming aside. It's a business at the end of the day. Uh, this is something that Australia recognizes as well. They'd rather ship their uh, boxed meat and other commodities to Dubai and have it redistributed from Dubai to get more premium rather than sell bulk to certain countries and lose out on the on the margin. So that concept is actually uh, and, um, that 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 system is, is is almost the same across the board. Um, Ethiopia is landlocked. It takes it a long time to ship his coffee out of Ethiopia. It could take three to four weeks uh, to get to come out. Uh, they are making an exception to their policy of value addition of roasting in Ethiopia and, and shipping green coffee straight to our center, having it stored there where they forecast the consumption of the, of the GCC uh, for their Arabica coffee, which comes from the Harar region. Now, Saudi Arabia and UAE used to consume a lot for the Arabic coffee. Today, I hear those farms in the Harar region have changed a little bit to address new types of... Uh, uh, new types of uh, coffee strains that that uh, that uh, that the coffee culture in the UAE and in Saudi and Gulf are looking for right now. I used to drink only Arabic coffee, sometimes Turkish coffee. Today, I'm drinking cold brew coffee um, from Honduras, from another region, single origin coffees. I'm not a big fan of coffee blends. I don't know what it is. I just feel like there's something off with coffee blends. Maybe someone will prove me wrong, but I'd rather challenge the strain itself. Um, you know, the, the one important thing that people need to understand about the DMCC, and I think it is, it's, it's a visual that people unfortunately, unfortunately don't have at this point, but it's, it's not only just a, a free zone by you know, DMCC to buy multi mm. Um There's a lot happening. You mentioned the tea, um, the, the, the tea center that um, is, is housed within, within um, yes. the DMCC umbrella, which has really taken the world by storm. Uh, the, the the Dubai Diamond Exchange. I mean, it's changed. Yes. Changed yes. the game. And I'll, I'll let you speak about that shortly. But it's changed the okay. game in, in, in how um, diamond trade um, is done globally and in how it's, it's, it's moved the center of, of power, if I may say that, um, the balance of power from from uh, uh, from, from Unbro to, to towards Dubai. And then you've also got the, the, the coffee center. So more than anything, uh, the DMCC Multi Commodity Center. Um, and where it's housed is in JLT, Jumeirah Lake Towers. I mean, this is a city in itself. If you look at the most places in the world that exist. Today, today it looks nice. It looks perfect and all that. In 2002, it was too far. It was outside, outside Dubai. Um, I recall uh, my management at the time. They were frustrated. And he would say, we don't have this. We need to create the KP office. We need this. This is not working. I told him that that's great news. He's like, what's so great about it? I said, you know exactly what needs to be done. So let's do it. I mean, it has to, you have to start somewhere. Excellent. You don't go to the gym with, with having all your muscles ready. You know where your weaknesses are. You need to focus on it. So, so uh, it was just an attitude thing. And I'm, I'm, I'm grateful that I'm someone that struggled in school with my dyslexia, my lack of uh, attention, etc. Because when I took the job, I just wanted to learn. I didn't. I did not worry about failing, and I think that gave me an edge over others uh, when I when we worked on DMCC. I, you've done you've done amazing, and I think why I mentioned JLT because in most places in the world, Africa, South Africa, for a full scale, city sized precinct to be built, uh -huh. 
is very rare. New cities are not being built in most in most places. So for you to, and this is, uh, you'll understand what I'm saying, the game within the game. I mean, Dubai in itself is, 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 is a very cutthroat place when it comes to, to real estate. It is. For it you is to very cutthroat. What you have developed at, in such a short space of time, um, to you, have the tallest, you, the tallest you, commercial you, building, Almas Tower, and then you build in a behemoth of, of a building to, 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 to become, um, I'm not, I don't want to say maybe I'll, I'll let you say it, so I don't, I don't steal. Well, it's, it's, uh, it's, first, we're building the smaller tower, which is 78 stories. It's the uptown tower. It has about the first 20 plus floors are offices, 20,000 square feet uh, per floor, needs gold building, and about, I think, 12 or 13 floors of a boutique hotel. We signed with Sofitel's So Brand, and we're calling it So Uptown. Um, the rest will be branded Resi. I'm now concerned about the branded Resi or the hotel. And the 20 floors, I'm in touch with a few multinationals that want to move there. It's pretty much done. And if need be, we'll move our headquarters there. I mean, we're okay with that. Um, the super tall tower, I'm not under pressure like the likes of Amar and other property entities who are listed or have commitments. That will be built as and when is needed. Um, I understand that the property market the businesses are changing as we speak. It might need more office space. If you're going to have social distancing between employees, it might be less. We are planning a webinar soon on South Africa. I will be connecting with the ambassador, our UAE ambassador to South Africa, to make sure that uh, we don't uh, leave, leave anything that falls to the crack and, you know, uh, UAE is a very important trading partner with South Africa. UAE uh, represents 60% of imports coming from South Africa going to the Arab, uh, Arab world. We are the number one trading partner. And I can tell you right now, we're not doing enough. We can do a lot more. Um, I, haven't promoted, I haven't promoted DMCC enough. I know that uh, some ministers, whether it's Mbeki or Shabango and others, are familiar with DMCC, but I don't think the trade are really familiar. I don't think I've done enough to promote DMCC. The diamond success didn't happen because of South Africa. The diamond success initially was because of our relationship with the Indian community, the closeness of Dubai to Mumbai. Uh, Flight-wise, we, it's a shorter flight to Mumbai than Mumbai to Delhi. That should give you a, an idea. Um, and today you have the biggest diamond producing uh, uh, city uh, where Surat is connect, is, has direct flights now to Sharjah, which has had a knock-on uh, positive effect to the diamond industry and in, 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 in Master and DMCC. Uh, but uh, I'm, 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 I don't have specific uh, concepts to, to promote uh, South Africa except with what we already have. So the way DMCC works is we... We went with the tea center, but we didn't know it would be success. We just said, let's give it a shot. I mean, we know that uh, one of the biggest consumers of teas is uh, Afghanistan, Iran, Pakistan. So we know, we know there is, there's a reason to explore it. Let's put it that way. Up till, up till two years ago, uh, for, the, for about seven or six years, Dubai was re-exporting 60% of world teas. And, uh, and, you know, that's credit to Unilever, the, tra the tea, tea, tea market in Dubai, but also the, the tea center. Now, because of that success, I couldn't ignore uh, not looking in the, into the coffee business because 80% of the countries that produce teas also produce coffees, which tells me the logistic connections are there, the network is there, the, 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 wave, the way is paved already. I just need to bring in the right tools, the right people in it, and it wasn't easy. You know, not everyone in the coffee industry wants DMCC to succeed and open up the business. Some people want to be gatekeeper, want to control it. But that's the old way. That doesn't work. Even in the, in the most difficult markets around the world, you, you see there's a push to open up. Saudi Arabia being closed before. Now with MBS pushing it, become, making it more international, more freer. Um, I don't want to say they're, they're following into Dubai's footsteps. It's not like that. It's more of this is what's needed. They've tried the old way. It doesn't help the economy on a macro level, and 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 on that sense. So, so it's 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 it's. I think I, I don't see it as as uh, as an issue for Dubai. It's going to complement our business. If Saudi Arabia's market grows and becomes becomes a bigger economic powerhouse, that will that will also create healthy synergies between us. It will it will create a lot of business. So, for example, 
we created the Gold and Commodities Exchange to fill the gap, the time zone in the Middle East, for those who felt that it might take away business from the U.S. exchanges and the Far East exchanges. No, it opened opportunities for uh, for arbitrage between these contracts with the similar contracts. Um, we we listed the first Indian uh, rupee future contract before India did, and that's one of our lead uh, performing contracts. I don't mind uh, listing the rand, and I'm ashamed to say I'm not sure if they did that or not. But we have the yen dollar, sterling pound dollar, the uh, the uh, Australian dollar, the Canadian dollar, the Swiss franc dollar. Um, I need to check the currencies. I I, it, we might have South Africa, but I don't know if it made a big splash. I need to double check. I should have done my homework. I'm ashamed to say that. But we have gold futures. We have gold options. Uh, you, you don't think so? You would have heard about it. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Can allow me to draw a parallel really, really, really sure. quickly. Um, build it and they will come. That's exactly uh, what Dubai has done. That's exactly what uh, the DMC, C, DMCC has done. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. um, you've created a center for people to come and occupy and be a part of the trading, whatever commercial activity. Mm -hmm. um, I've had the pleasure of, of, of meeting and being hosted by um, His Excellency Sheikh Ahmed of Emirates. Yes. Uh, um, so he was telling he was telling us a story um, was a few years back with his experience with South Africa, um, and he said that I think it was in the late 80s, early 90s. So this was during the apartheid era. Um, era. He traveled to, to South Africa, um, and I think it was his first, uh, one of his first trips there. Mm -hmm. um, I know there's, there's an affinity for, for the, the hunting and the safari um, from the Gulf, the Gulf region with yes. South Africa and other African countries. So he'd met some of the leadership at that time of, of, of government, and was saying, you know what, I have an idea. Yes. I would like you guys to identify a tract of land right, that we can develop. Right? So for a hotel they, and a safari? No, 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 no. For, for oh. uh, a new city. So at this point, Dubai wasn't, uh, was far from, from where it is now. And uh, okay. Abu Dhabi as well. So the concept at that time already that was given by, uh, by His Excellency the Ruler was... Okay. Obviously, to, 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 to get the plan going and to, to start setting up the possibility of creating what is Dubai today. So he was saying, yes. this, is, this is the, the, we have a blueprint in mind, and this is what we'd like to replicate inside. Maybe a bit smaller, but we just need you to identify a similar, um, an area with similar conditions. Um, there's an area called the Karoo in, um, in South Africa, which is desert-like conditions. And anywhere else that the government felt that, um, um, the, 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 the UAE leadership would come and invest. Uh, and the guy didn't take him seriously, um, this is according to his, his recollection, saying, you know what, he spoke to them and they didn't believe in his vision. And fast forward many years later, here we have Dubai, the most advanced city in the world. Um, and he said, he had, he was, he was sitting in, in, in a meeting, I'm not sure where, where he said it was. And yes. one, of the, one of the gentlemen that was part of that delegation at that time was sitting in the meeting and recognized him and said, sir, I'd like to apologize. And he says, apologize for it. So he reminded him about, about um, the scenario and said, I was one of the gentlemen that was part of the South African side of the delegation that was listening to, to, to um, the, the ideas that you had at that point for what Dubai would be in X amount of years. And we thought that it was not possible. The, the, the reason we apologize is we see what you've developed and we should have taken that opportunity. Uh, mm -hmm. So. The reason I mention this is you've done the same thing with the DMCC and JLT. If you look at um, his rule, um, his excellency, the ruler, um, and the 2071 vision, and the reason why I'm speaking out loud is this is something that I believe we as Africans can learn: is setting a road, setting a time frame, and setting those milestones, even if it seems long-winded and, and and further down the line. Because the one thing that has that completely blown my mind is if Dubai had to stop developing today, Dubai would be futuristic, would still look futuristic in 50 years' time. This is how this place has been put together. It's amazing. So well, Vision, well, 20, uh, yeah. Vision 2071, they've got the specific timelines and budgets. I may be wrong, but this is what I understand. And budgets that have been allocated towards achieving what Dubai will be in 2071. 
that was, now we were in uh, Vision 2071, if I'm not mistaken, was announced in 2018. Uh, mm. I stand to be corrected. I mean, that's the sort of planning that goes into, and then the sort of vision that, that goes into to what the UAE is about. Because a lot of us Africans will think about um, the Arab world, the Gulf world, the Middle East, the UAE, more specifically, because it's, it's, it's a worldwide thing of uh, people that exist um, in opulence, people that do not have an idea of what's going on in the world. It's oil wealth, and they just have these copious amounts of, of money just in bank accounts and stashed in bunkers, whatever it is that people think. But once you experience what this region has to offer, the amount of intellect that, that exists, the goal-getting nature, the vision, most importantly, the vision, because everyone that sits has got a vision in mind and sticks to that vision. And they do, and then this is, this is something that I've seen you do as well. You stick to a vision and you will do your damnedest to make sure you get to that end goal. Whether you're part of, of that journey in two, 20 years time, doesn't matter. As long as you've played your part, your part, that's what matters. And that's something that, you know, we need to learn and, as Africans because we keep changing the game every change of, 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 of leadership, every change of regime. And, you know, we can never get to, to, to this promised land. And we need to learn from what has been done. In, in well, you know, you know, the thing is, what, what I'm really grateful for Hassan Sheikh Mohammed is that he allowed different, different uh, personalities to, 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 to have a fair chance to prove themselves. Uh, by the time I joined the MCC, His Highness' time frame of giving each project uh, time to develop has changed. So it took about Jabal Ali 20 years to reach where it was in early 2000. About 20 years for uh, the aviation industry and Emirates Group. But at that time, he goes, I'm not patient enough to have another 20 years. So the plan was four or five years only. Of course, it would take eight, 10 years. But the fact that they had a target of doing it sooner rather than in 10 years makes it, if it, it would have been even longer if that was the case. Now, I joined the MCC. Most of the development in JLT was sold. We had a few specs of land that we developed. Um, and, you know, we used challenges to our advantage. So... Al Mas Tower was sold out in 2004, end of 2004, to end users in about six or seven hours. We had an Oracle system, and for some reason, the trade was looking for an alternative to wherever they were, whether it be Tel Aviv, Antwerp, or Mumbai, or New York. They liked the concept of having something in Dubai. And it was a bit challenging because, uh, you know, the banks refused to finance the ownership. They did not like commercial entities to be owning the uh, office units. They want an individual's name, a bank guarantee, etc. We were saved by Abu Dhabi Commercial Bank. They were the only bank that allowed it. I was a board director in Tamwil, and I barely got one company. And it's Neil Haddock, who was, the, who was for many years the commercial director of De Beers, and then he set up Global Tenders. You even see my picture, a 24-year-old Ahmed holding a rough diamond in the old diamond exchange that was facing the airport in one of the first rough diamond auctions. Um, to, t to, to tell you I knew where we would be when I took that picture, no. So much that Samer and Dominique, who are with us online right now and the marketing team, are begging him to take my picture off his website. I said, don't, this is history, leave it. That's a whole other, that's kind of an alternate world today. Um, I never forget that, you know? And uh, today when we promote DMCC, it's not just the concept, it's not just the free zone status, Every member who comes and sets up here knows they are going to connect to buyers, to traders, to sellers. They will be connected to a market community that is regulated. I wouldn't say regulated, but it's checked and they, they feel that they are in a healthy environment. So with gold, we have the Dubai Good Delivery. And if a refinery doesn't meet the standard, it gets delisted. Wherever it's based, whether it's Utah or, 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 or in Japan or whatever, they all adhere to these standards. And Dubai is, gonna, is creating its own uh, price discovery, local Dubai. Um, and that's kind of what we're doing with the gold coins. You know, it's, it's getting uh, accepted. We are reviving a historical trading center. We were the global trading center when it comes to pearls. And it wasn't because of my ancestors diving for pearls. It was more than that. You had pearl traders bringing in their pearls from India, from China, from all over, coming to Dubai and trading. And pearl, pearl traders would store their pearls for the next season. It was a system like you see today. 
um, you talk to the diamond industry. Yes, the market is bad. COVID doesn't help, but they find ways. They buy cheaper diamonds for, the, for when the market will go up. They know it's going to go up. You, people are going to, kids are going to grow up. They're going to meet some, the perfect partner. They're going to have to make a commitment. And, uh, you know, whether it's in gold or it's in diamonds or some other stone, they're competing. Um, I, and before, before, when I was in San Francisco, I did the taboo thing as far as the diamond industry is concerned. I, I met with Martin and uh, the diamond foundry for the first time, saw his facility. He used to, his, his type of industry used to be criticized by the natural diamond industry. They used to say, you're not eco-friendly. You attack us saying we're not eco-friendly. Well, you're not. It takes energy, chemicals, etc. Well, guess what? He used the weaknesses to strengths. Now it's completely solar powered and it's, it's, uh, it's eco-friendly. And he has, he has a market. It uh, still is to about 2% of the diamond industry. But who does he supply his diamonds to? Any retailer that wants uh, lab-grown diamonds or, uh, yeah, lab-grown diamonds. Uh, you, have, you have Swarovski that never touched natural diamonds. It's only crystals. Well, now they like the idea of also lab-grown diamonds and they've jumped into Hollywood, etc. This pushed the natural diamond industry to, to come up with what used to be called the Diamond Promotion uh, Producers Association. Now I think it's called the Natural Diamonds Association. Um, and they've changed the slogan. It used to be called, uh, for, for, it used to be called what? Uh, they used to say, a diamond is forever, a diamond is a woman's best friend. Well, now they give it a bit of a divinity. They say before there was life, there were diamonds. So, you know, with the angels, before, <laughs> before humans were created, I guess. Uh, but, but, you know, I'm enjoying this. I, 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 I literally don't feel anxious for where the market is. Like I, if I would quote uh, Les, our CEO of our Golden Commodities Exchange, he doesn't mind that challenges come and go in, in, in the world because it, it creates volatility in the gold, silver, the WTI, the Brent contract. Um, I'm, 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 I think I know that DMCC is very well known for diamonds and gold. And, uh, and sooner than later, you might see Dubai being... I don't know for how long, but might might be take it will take over Antwerp as the largest diamond center in the world, and it will likely also touch or be also the largest or number one gold center in the world. Given given the hunger we have, given how Dubai and the UAE government is reacting to these pandemics, they're not looking to raise fees. They're not looking to kick out uh, expatriates. They are they are they're they're taking they're they're applying the same attitude of our founder, the late uh, Sheikh Zayed, uh, Sultan Nahyan, who, who founded the UAE based on tolerance, based on, on making it an international, making it an international country that accepts all, all ethnicities, all religions, uh, and, and that's, that's happening. He knew, His Highness, that maybe 40 years ago, 30 years ago, it's too early to do these changes overnight, but they are happening. I mean, look at the US. 400 years later, they're still uh, struggling with their past, but it will happen. It's painful, but it will happen. Um, I, I, I'm really happy that we have the social media tool. I could talk to you directly from wherever you are, and we, we talk about opportunities, we're accessible. But I was gonna come to my other point. DMCC is the largest energy-free zone in the Middle East and North Africa. We have over 1,100 companies in the energy sector and renewable energy sector, and we will continue to grow. Um, I don't get a lot of complaints and headaches from the energy sector. I don't know why. They, they got their things sorted out, but I'm blessed to have them. But mentioning oh, that, I mentioned- the conferences at Anantara a few months ago. That was quite interesting. Too. Yes, yes. Uh, and it's you know, funny. they come, they come and it's funny, the only request I had from the energy sector was about in 2006 or seven. They said, it's hard for us, not hard. They just said, we'd prefer not to be called uh, a member of Dubai Metals and Commodity Center. So we changed metals to multi-commodity center. It still had the initial DMCC. That's the most I heard from them. Um, but I think, I think, and I, 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 I not to, uh, no offense to any of the commodities we focused on, the biggest stories yet to come will be the coffee. 
the coffee success in DMCC mm -hmm. and Dubai. We have yet to scratch the surface, and I've pretty much connected with every single strong player in the coffee industry. And usually around this time, you would see me looking at cacao. I'm looking at cacao, but I still feel that I need to protect coffee a little bit more and make sure that we have a similar type of synergy and ecosystem that we have with tea, gold, and diamonds. What I mean by that is the community engages with different countries. This is what you see with the diamond industry. I get feedback from the diamond industry, hey, Ahmed, we need this or that. I'm not having that relationship yet with coffee. It's still fragmented, I believe. It's still settling. Like one of the things that made me pay attention to, to coffee, I mentioned that the success of tea opened the door. That is true. When we were talking to PricewaterhouseCooper, PwC, they had halal meat, which I think is very important, but I still did not go with it. They had powdered milk, saffron, which I didn't want to touch because Iran's production went down to zero and Spain went up a thousand percent, which means they're smuggling it to Spain and Spain is branding it as Spanish uh, saffron. I don't want to get involved with that. But I look, at into these, I look into these details. But I, w I went for coffee. Um, coming back to my point, uh, gold, I'm... It's like a family, like literally as, as if I have neighbors who talk to me in the gold industry. Diamonds is kind of, we're all in this together. Tea is more or less, they've, they've settled. But coffee is not yet there. I do not want the coffee industry to be dealt with, with the lenses of, uh, looking at it through the lenses of the coffee center only. Yes, it, the coffee center provides blending package, uh, blending facility, packaging facility, roasting facility, a coffee lab, coffee training institute, the coffee business center. But to me, that's not enough. I, I still want the senior and the corporate uh, management of DMCC to keep coffee close to them, to see what else we can add. So today we're talking about adding a bottling, uh, a cold brew bottling facility there. We might bring in an auction facility as well, if that does make sense. We know that the coffee demand is still uh, strong despite COVID. It's just, it's just the way things are packaged, the way farms will, will go on with their business will change. What will change for diamonds, gold, di and tea, and coffee, and other commodities is that whether it used to, if it was labor intensive, it's going to be less labor intensive. If, if, if the pushback was about uh, you, you lose jobs, if you, if you bring in the AI and the robots, you, there won't be any business. You need to have it less labor intensive. I'm not going against the workforce. I know it's a sensitive matter in India and other countries, but what are you gonna do? You have to, you have, to have control of your product until, until there's a proper cure to these, to these viruses. Um, but going back to coffee, I'm very excited. Some of the things I'm looking at, but very cautious about uh, rushing into, is having a coffee future contract. We do not want to replicate what the U.S. have. I did hear about when uh, Colombia was burning their coffee farms, revamping them. The expectations was if the supply goes down, then the price should go up. Nothing changed in the price. So these contracts do not really reflect what happens on the ground. So we might look at maybe listing rather than a gen general coffee contract, looking at specialty contracts or, or other specs. So we'll talk to the market. I'm not there to, to make a statement with our coffee future contract. We will look at it. If it makes sense, we'll go with it. But for now, I think we've touched on everything. What's left is, as I mentioned, the cold brew buttering the, uh, and maybe an auction facility. We'll see. Also, we have not uh, given a proper coffee festival in Dubai. And unfortunately, these big gathering and events are not something of what will happen uh, until until mm -hmm. these, uh, these, these challenges are sorted. Because the resources in these African countries by far exceeds what Dubai and the UAE have. Central African Republic has so much oil, gold, and we know it's due to leadership that we're, we are where we are today and God's blessing. So I, I, I never forget that. Not at all. I never forget that it was only about 40-something years that we became a country. For the past seven, uh, 17, for the past 19 years, um, it's been th that case. There, there, there's ups and downs, but when, when, there is a, when there are challenging times, you need to look at the opportunities within, within those challenges. And you have to be careful when things are going well as well. Um, I was very, very, I was happy about 
the growth of DMCC from the global recession days of 2008 till about uh, five, six months ago, where we would register over 2,000 companies a year. We were just 1,000 something in 2008. And then uh, we passed 17,000. But I knew the good times don't last forever. And we have to be ready for a storm that comes in. And if we, if we, uh, if we withstand the storm, we will reap the benefit. And what I like about being in Dubai, they, 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 they put the safety of the community ahead of uh, everything else. Dubai, Dubai in the UAE was one of the first city and countries to, to go through lockdown so it can get out of the lockdown. And what you see around the world are countries that, that the ones that have, have, not locked, have not taken the, the necessary steps are going to lose out by, co by connecting with the global market a month or three months later. It's going to be a difficult task, you know, a dance of not completely shutting down the economy and not co quickly opening up. So I think I think it's going the right direction. Um, a few few weeks ago, people did not know if things will open up. Now there's a clearer picture as to when and how. So so we we're pretty comfortable. And the fact is, we're all in this together. Whether it be China, whether it be South America, Canada, they're all dealing with it in their own way. Absolutely. Anyways, I I digressed a lot. I leave the questions right. to you. Not at all. That, I mean, that was, that was um, a lot of useful information. Thank you very much for, for sharing it. There are times when you need to sit, stand back. And I have to say that I took a step back when the pandemic and the, when, when I heard your president shut down the airport and say we're in a state of disaster and emergency. Uh, it shook me a little bit. But after two days, uh, on a personal level, my lawyer sent me a message. And she's like, well, you know, we talked to this prosecutor. And we did this and that. I'm like, Really? You're talking to me like nothing happened? <laughs> so the, I, I have to say, the community in Dubai brought me back into Dubai. Just seeing them active and moving on like, yeah. like nothing, I, I have to say. I mean, she doesn't know it. Her name is Ashley. She works for a Tamimi law firm. And when I got that message, it brought back life into me. I mean, I went into Sierra Leone in 2006 or seven, And, you know, part of the... Uh, safety guidelines. I mean, what was the safety guidelines uh, during the COVID pandemic or be right before the COVID pandemic? Wash your hands and then later on wear a mask, etc. Well, in Sierra Leone, when you take a shower, don't open your eyes while you take a shower. Like, you know, you know what that does to you mentally? So I used to say, well, thank God in Dubai we didn't have this. But, but these are things that makes you appreciate your country. People will uh, will will uh, live with COVID and will will play it careful. I think I think as soon as you see more accurate testing uh, kits um, and faster results, people will will be more comfortable to go out because it's all about knowing who has the virus or who doesn't have a virus. It's the asymptomatic uh, people that was that was a concern. This virus is not going to be the issue forever. The world will not be in lockdown forever. I mean. Look at, look at the U.S. with all their protests for the last 11 days. What kind of social distancing is happening there? They've, they've gone out. They're, they're, so, so there are different priorities. And these are not priorities to go to work. These are priorities to protest, you know, make a statement, etc. So, And in France and Italy, Italy, I'm seeing videos of people going to the restaurant. Nobody's wearing a mask except, you know, you'd see the waiter here or there. So maybe the restaurant, you know, wants to be extra cautious and all that. Um, Think people will adapt. I mean, uh, we we coexisted with the HIV. We coexisted with cancer. We coexisted with, I mean, it's, it's more or less like people driving. You know, for, for a long time, people did not wear seatbelts. Now they wear seatbelts. Two years ago, three years ago, the people who sit in the back are wearing seatbelts. We adapt. I just yeah. hope we don't adapt to drivers' cars. I can't trust. Uh, uh, I trust any AI driving my car because I have bad luck with technology. Every gadget I have will have something wrong with it. Either I'm causing it to the telephone or computer or whatever. I just cannot do the autopilot thing. And I don't no, want to hear the story about planes being autopilot either. I don't care. No, I think we'll, we'll get to a point. And I mean, there's a lot of positive technology developments yes. happening in this region. I'm sure we'll, we'll get that right. Uh, Mr. Ben Saleh, you were on a, on a, a tour recently. Um, a few weeks yes. ago, you, tra you travel a lot. And part of your one of your stops was actually South Africa this time around. It was supposed to be. You yes. know what? I I wanted to save my energy for South Africa, and I did not plan to do Davos in I think February, but we signed an agreement with Crypto Valley to ro roll out blockchain 
uh, blockchain and a crypto ecosystem in, in DMCC, which, we, which we're working and it's happening. It's actually, at that time, it felt a bit far-fetched. Why, what are we in rush for, for a futuristic uh, free zone? Well, today you need such things more than ever. The more automated, the faster, the more you save time, the better it is, the less, the, the less you need to go out. Uh, but there's a lot more to it than that. Uh, this, is, this is how the, the future will be. Um, just as we, as we round, up, round up, I think I'm just keeping an interest on, an eye on, on, on time. Just two more, two more questions. Uh, the first one being, with everything that's happened with COVID-19, I know you touched upon um, some corona-related uh, insights early on, but just mm -hmm. pointedly, as a DMCC, you being the head of this fine institution, um, what is the way forward from this point on? What can we expect in the next coming weeks? Months? You know, you know, in two thousand six, I think, or seven, I was in California for the GIA symposium, and I have an African story from Martin Rappaport, a name well known in South Africa as well. And right before Chris Isaac performance in, in Ma'awad uh, campus in Carlsbad, in GIA's campus, um, he said the story about two rabbis in Africa. And to me, if I would re re say the story, the, the two rabbis saw a lion running towards them, ch coming towards them. And to me, the lion is COVID pandemic, okay? It's gonna, there will be people hurt. Like there's no, no one saying that you, the whole world will, will overcome it. Unfortunately, there will be casualties. So, so, so the one, one rabbi is praying to God since he believes he's gonna see God soon, which means, He's given up or, or, or you know, uh, accepted the inevitable. But then he notices the other rabbi wearing running shoes. Because what are you doing, my friend? You cannot outrun a lion. He goes, yes, you're right. I cannot outrun a lion. I just need to outrun you to survive. <laughs> and as heartless as that sounds, that's exactly what we're doing. I know that DMCC is faster, more efficient nimble and can adjust why we've done it in 2008 when we did not have a benchmark on how to adjust restructure and reposition our branding we're doing it now and guess what yesterday at the Almas tower i saw members who bought into dmcc the guy i thought the guy would be upset about the market conditions no he is happy in fact i was sitting behind him not not dressed in the national dress and I said, I'd like to introduce myself. I said, he said, I know who you are. You're Ahmed bin Sudeir. So he didn't surprise him to see me sitting behind him, uh, which was flattering to me. But uh, I hate to say it, but I'm enjoying this. I'm learning. I'm get the, the, there was a Moody's uh, report or study on, on what entities in the government of Dubai were most impacted by COVID. And DMCC was not directly impacted by COVID. I take pride in that, uh, in that uh, study. Uh, uh, I take pride because, and, and I, I hope also, and I think His Highness also Sheikh Mohammed takes pride that he established this, uh, this free zone, this initiative, which despite the pandemic, despite these challenges, is still standing its ground, which means after this uh, storm passes, you know we will grow phenomenally. And we will be we will be growing our uh, community even further and attract and, and and strengthening our relationship. I I have a lot of sleepless nights because a lot of my Zoom meetings are with the U.S., Canada, Latin America, and all of them are equating businesses being set up in DMCC, especially as soon as the airports are open. One of the first stops, if not the first stop, is Dubai and DMCC. I'm 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 not. Uh, I'm not uh, saying this to over promote DMCC. If I couldn't back this up, I wouldn't say this right now. So I, I feel in some ways, and I, I, I know this is, sounds like a cliche, but this pandemic is, kind of, is a blessing in disguise for us. We get, we, the curtains have been lifted and people know where everyone stands. And I love that. Awesome. Kobe Bryant Park in uh, JLT. Um, basketball, court, basketball court, basketball <laughs> court. I, do, I, do, I don't want to be sued. He, he, gave me, he gave me the approval on the fly while we were in the office. I said, can we call the basketball court after you? And I could see his, office, his teams are like, no, taking advantage. He didn't care. I mean, the way he saw it is 
it came, a request came from the person who put out a full page ad on LA Times. It wasn't about money, but uh, yeah, it's still there. It's still there. I mean, it was planned a- by my by my team to put a hotel in that place, and I said no, no hotel. Basketball think, court is still Kobe Bryant. I think what what's important is you had your personal relationship uh, with him yes. over the years. Um, unfortunately, you, you met an untimely end. Mm-hmm. But um, he too was a, a member of the GMCC. Um, he was he was doing um, whatever businesses he was he was looking to to establish or operate. He liked he liked mm-hmm. the attitude uh, that the MCC brought. Um, this was 2013, mind you, huh? And uh, he wants to be international. And he felt there was a lot in common between his company's approach and what DMCC brought to the table. For me, I'm not going to lie to you. I, I still have not processed the fact that I saw Kobe in the way. I'm, I'm, I'm an ultra fan and I couldn't process it. Like, I just couldn't believe it. I mean, to tell you how much I didn't expect his visit, I was seriously out of shape when he came. And I wouldn't be out of shape had I known this would be happening, you know? So I, I just looked like this uh, super gamer, overweight and all this. We joked a little bit. I told him, like, the things that I do with you on PlayStation. He's like, what do you do with me? Well, you know, uh, before, before the second half starts, I'm like 58 points. He's like, I don't do that no more. I'm like, no, not when I have the joystick. So, you know, I, I, to, me, to me... To me, he's, he's kind of uh, more than a brother. I mean, I, I, we're the same age. Um, and his, his attitude in the court, his, 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 his willing to take risks and miss shots, you know, the, and his willing to learn and adjust. The thing that I noticed about him and that impact, impacted me is that he's not the same Kobe from 99, 2000, 2003. When I saw him in 2013, there was a bigger, more human aspect of him that I, I didn't have at that time. And I'm, I'm trying to, uh, to, to be more conscious, more mindful as we go. Um, it's, it's, just some, it's, just a, it's just a strange experience. I never saw him come to Dubai. Seriously, you've I never made, saw that made, happening. You paid an amazing tribute to him. And we thank you for what yes. I mean, he did in, in Dubai. The Burj Khalifa, I think that is still today, um, has left the mark. By the way, Kobe, Kobe also visited South Africa during the World Cup. Yes. I recall seeing his photos there. You know, there's, there's that, uh, that's, the, that's the international uh, aspect of Kobe. You know, he's, he's in Spain. He speaks multiple languages, Italian, Spanish. Um, he has a house in Barcelona, I believe. Uh, but uh, I, think, I think his biggest success and biggest impact and, mess and influence, I think, to the rest of the world, he was the perfect father. 100%. And uh, and uh, and that's that's the part that uh, when 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 you say untimely death, that's the part that hurts the most. That he really wanted to do so much more for his daughters, Absolutely. and uh, and you know if if there's any message you take from his death is, you know, uh, just just spend more time with your loved ones and, uh, and 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 drop the distractions, drop the distractions and. That's something that uh, that cut hard for me. I mean, I didn't I didn't process that he died until until the display I posted on, for him on Burj Khalifa came down. That's where my mind kept telling me, you know what, he's really dead. He's really gone. That would not have, have happened. So I started in my head. I don't know if this makes any sense to you. I started processing the fact that he did. No, he's not with us. It, it, it so, times, so that's. So. Yeah, for, for me, I couldn't, it just didn't register, you know? Mr. Mr. Ben Saleh, uh, just rounding up, um, I'd like to thank you for, for your time, um, yourself and, and your team for giving me this opportunity to have this discussion, to pose a few questions and to get in-depth responses from, from your side. Um, I will, I will segue my ending by saying, you spoke about Kobe being the ultimate risk taker will take shots, even though he might miss. And this is an attribute I've seen in you. Um, you are at the helm of a, a, a company that's performing very well globally, in the number one free trade zone mm-hmm. in the world. Um, it, it, it's, I won't say it's, it's, it's recession. We'll, we, will be, we, will be, we, will be, we will be the number one free zone for 2020. And I know a lot of businesses have uh, written this year off. I don't care. 
we're not writing this year off. We will be the number one three zone for this year, or, or, or God damn it, we're going to make it hard for anyone to be the number one this, three this zone. Is the attitude that, this is the attitude yes. that I appreciate. About. This, is what I, this is what I learned from, from spending Thank whatever um, time and opportunity I have to spend in, in your space. You are an executive chairman, you're a CEO, um, you're the son to a very successful and, and very revered father. Um, your father, Sultan Ahmed bin Salam, who's done some very amazing things in, in this region. Um, he's, he's a shining beacon of, of what we'd all hope and aspire to be um, as business people and as, as, as game changers. Um, you are a leader, you're a decision maker, and the most important thing about you is you're not afraid to make decisions. And I salute you for that because a lot of people are afraid to make those difficult decisions that will impact them possibly. That's Negative. What you just said is, is something that we've learned from Sheikh Muhammad. He says the biggest risk in life is not taking it. And, uh, and that's something that always resonates with me. Final words from your side, closing remarks, remarks words of advice, words of, of, of inspiration to, to people that look up to you, um, people that may be seeing uh, you for the time and understanding exactly who you are. Well, the best advice, like what I've learned so far, and I, I follow, I follow uh, Professor Jordan Peterson a lot. I can't apply everything he advice, I'll admit to that. And one of the things he says is, it's more important to know what you don't know. Understand what you don't know. Don't assume things. And there's, a, there's an advice his highness also touches on when it comes to these things. Never expect, always inspect. Always inspect. Uh, I'm also dyslexic when I read things, so I always show people what I'm looking at, just in case, so it's become natural to me. And, and just understand that no, no human uh, that was born on this planet didn't make a mistake. I mean, it doesn't matter. Even, even when you have these negative thoughts that you might follow, it takes you to scary areas, you have to understand these ideas, even though they're scary ideas or taking you to dark places, you, these are ideas embedded in you to protect your family, your house, your place from the others. It's so you understand what the others think. Don't take whatever business or person presents themselves as. Do your homework. You'll be shocked how fast you're going to get uh, if, if they're bad people or bad businesses. Things come up fast. Sure. Also, this is on gold. There's no such thing as, as discounting gold. That does not exist. Okay? Let's just have this settled, guys. The email, I have gold and it's discounted, forget it. And another thing, there is no African prince that needs an account or open this, forget it. They, that's over now. Okay? It's run its course at least. Uh, forget about that as well. There are a lot of opportunities in Africa. Africa will be a superpower. Africa will be a superpower, and I'll tell you why. The same way Dubai is growing, why is Dubai growing? It is on the new Silk Road. It's connected with India and China. It's going to be part of the One Road, One Belt uh, initiative. Some say the COVID changed it and all this. No, the way business will change. But the, 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 the Chinese are, will be back, and will be back really strong. And Africa has yet... To, to, to be truly economically independent from its, co its colonial history. And when that happens, if you're not part of the African story, you have messed out. So coming, we will have coming. a presence one way or the other. Um, my, my big brother, before I hand over to you for closing remarks, yeah. I'd just like to say for South Africa, South Africa is open for business. Um, you had whatever experiences you've had. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting your father as well and he, he, he detailed some of the experiences he had um, with with um, his past uh, endeavors in, in South Africa. I think moving forward, I'd like to reassure you that those opportunities and opportunities to do amazing things, opportunities for the trade relationships between South Africa and the UAE and taking mm -hmm. to the next level are mm -hmm. far more apparent now than they ever have been. And that's discussions we'll, we'll take offline. So please continue to have the faith in, in Africa, continue to have the faith in South Africa. That there's a lot that um, still needs to be done. There's a lot that we will need yourself and many others like yourself in, in the UAE to assist us. I look, I look forward. I look forward to visiting South Africa. I look forward to visiting the places I committed to go to before the pandemic, Durban, uh, Cape Town, Joburg, and any other place you deem fit for our visit. And if possible, I will visit the Kimberley Mine there. 
and, and, and at least throw a rock there and see how long it takes to reach the bottom. I want to do that. I'm not going to do the bungee jump, but I will do something along those lines. No, that's done. Consider it done. To you and your, your, your team behind the scenes, I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. This has been an honor, a privilege, and uh, I wish you all the best on, on your... A, great, a greater honor to me, Dudu, if I could go back in time and tell that Ahmed, who was sitting in the lobby talking to the Lebanese guy, you're going to talk to Jacob Zuma's son, I'd be like, dude, what are you smoking on? Get the hell out of my face, man. Like, I'm here to get experience. And I, I just want to tell you, I am more than honored to have had this interview with you. And I wish you all the best in whatever you put your mind to. Thank you very much, my big brother. I appreciate it. Thank you. See you. Take care.